All right, John chapter four, but we, before we, we get straight into it, I want to just cover some background and uh, a few things leading up to it. The last two weeks, we've been working through event number 30. And as you all are very much aware, that's how we've been doing this study is events, one event after the next. And uh, we have now arrived at event number 30, and we've kind of hung out here for a good while. One, it's 42 verses in this one event, and furthermore, there's just a lot of information to look at and to consider concerning the woman at the well. And uh, last week, I showed you how John devotes a lot of time in chapter 3 uh, with his encounter with the, the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus spends the majority of that whole chapter. And then in chapter 4, the very next chapter, he deals with Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And we're talking about two totally different people from two different origins, two different backgrounds. And, and really what John is trying to reveal is how Jesus was no respecter of persons. It didn't matter who you were. He gave everyone the same equal measures of love and grace. But John chapter 4 uh, the scenario with the woman at the well was really the beginning stages where Jesus would incorporate Gentiles into his redemptive work. For centuries, there was always this cultural thought that only Israel was appointed for God's promises and God's blessings and even salvation. And everyone else who was not Jewish or of the seed of Abraham, well, tough luck. You're not part of God's covenant. That was just the overall cultural Outlook, And here in John chapter 4, this is the beginning where Jesus would shatter that culture by uh, appealing to a Samaritan woman. For instance, when Jesus was uh, born, he was first introduced to the shepherds. Remember, the shepherds were keeping watch over their flock, and it was revealed to them by an angel that uh, this night a child is born in the city of David, a savior. So the shepherds came, and they were the first to be introduced to the Messiah. And the shepherds represent who? Israel. National Israel, because they were Jewish. But then later, we see the wise men being introduced to the baby Jesus. So the three wise men, and they represented who? The Gentiles, those that were not is, uh, of Israelite origin. So right at his birth, we already see where Jesus was born for the world, both Jew and Gentile. And uh, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he first revealed and appealed himself to the lost sheep of Israel, those of Judea. And if you recall, back in John chapter 2, that's when Jesus, he cleanses the temple. And then the rest of that week of Passover, he performs miracles. And those were all miracles performed in the sight of God's people, uh, Israel. But then later, uh, he would go on to reveal himself to the Samaritan woman. And as we travel uh, through the Gospels even further, we're going to come in contact with more and more Gentiles that Jesus dealt with. Uh, even when the early church was birthed in Acts chapter 2, how many was in the upper room that night? Or that day, I should say, when the Spirit came? 120. 120. All of which were Jewish. So the Holy Spirit was given first to the Jew. But then in uh, Acts chapter 8, that's when Philip goes where? Samaria. And now we begin to see half Jew being incorporated into God's redemption plan. And then finally in Acts chapter 10, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius was a full-blown Gentile, no Jewish origin whatsoever. So I, I said all that to reveal how God's redemptive plan is for all nationalities, all races. Uh, there, there is no one that is an exception from God's grace. Uh, going back into the Old Testament, even the Old Testament revealed that God's grace was to be given for everyone, not just Israel. Uh, there's the classic story of Jonah, Jonah and the well. We're all familiar with that story. Uh, Jonah ran from God because of what? What was the reason? Why did Jonah run from God? Was it because he was just scared to preach? No, he refused to preach. God called him to preach to Nineveh, a city of uh, Gentiles, the Assyrians. And Jonah just flat out refused. No, I'm not doing it. And we know the story. He flees, boards a ship, and gets thrown overboard. And what happens to Jonah? Swallowed up by a whale. And he's in the belly of the whale for how many days and nights? 
Y'all know this. Jesus said, as Jonah was in the in the belly of the well for three, three days, three, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, speaking of the tomb. Well, anyway, after Jonah is brought out of the belly of the well, in Jonah chapter 4, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. Even after he's brought out, and even after he agrees to preach and does so, he's still bitter about it. And it says in chapter 4, the last chapter of that book, it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. This was after he preached to Nineveh, and the whole city got saved. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was in my country? Therefore, the reason I fled to Tarshish is because I knew you are a gracious God, you're merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents thee of the evil that man does. So Jonah is basically admitting the reason why I'm so angry is because I know that your grace will be given to anyone who accepts it, and simply I'm discriminating against the Assyrians. That was Jonah's dilemma. But even going all the way back to Genesis 12, way early on when Abraham is called, the Lord made it very clear to Abraham that his seed would be a blessing to who? The nations, plural, plural. Not just, not just his seed, but the nations of the world. And Israel, uh, they either misinterpreted that or they just overlooked it. And they wanted to basically harbor all of God's blessings and love for themselves and themselves only. Uh, Isaiah 45.22 is a reference where Gentiles would be saved. The Lord in Isaiah 45.22 says, Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And then if you go over to Isaiah 49.6, uh, it says, I will also give a light to the Gentiles that they may seek me and find salvation unto the end of the earth. So right there in the Old Testament, we have overwhelming evidence that the gospel was to be given to both Jew and Gentile, the entirety of the world. And then in Luke chapter 2, we've already covered this within this study. This is right after the birth of Jesus, where Joseph and Mary take him to the temple to be dedicated. And it was there where a man by the name of Simeon, he was an elderly man, he was given a promise many years before the birth of Jesus that he would not die before what? Anyone remember? Seeing the Christ. Seeing the Messiah personally, physically. And when the time came that they brought the baby Jesus to the temple to dedicate him, Simeon was there. And as soon as he saw the baby, he knew that that's the one. And he takes the child up in his arms and says, and this is in Luke 2, verses 30 through 32, for my eyes have seen salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. Here it is, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of that people Israel. So even Simeon, of all people, he's not a prophet. He, he's not anyone that is really, you know, stands out in a prophetic ministry. And yet Simeon realized that the, the Messiah would be for uh, the fall and rise of many including Gentiles. And then finally, over in Romans chapter 3, uh, 28 and 29, again, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to throw these at you. It says in Romans 3, 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith. <clears throat> he is, uh, is he the God of the Jews only? No, but I say also to the Gentiles. Yes, the Gentiles also. And then in Acts chapter 13, that's when Paul and Barnabas they embark on their first missions trip. They go to Antioch, which is basically primarily Jews, and they're rejected. And Paul says, um, but seeing that you have put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy for everlasting life, we will now turn to the Gentiles. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles. So, again, overwhelming evidence that the gospel is for all people, all nations, all tongues, all tribes. But the beginning of it would really begin here in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. So let's go ahead and pick up from where we left off. John chapter 4, verse 29. Jesus has now revealed himself as the Messiah. And it's only uh, Jesus and this woman at the well, no one else. His disciples have gone off to purchase bread. 
And there was a reason for that. Jesus made sure that he would be alone with this woman so that he could get through. Otherwise, if he brought his disciples, that would have been very intimidating. She probably wouldn't have stayed. She would have left as soon as she saw that many men at the well. So Jesus makes it a point to send them off to purchase food, and he alone goes there for one person, one purpose, that would result in a major outcome. And the major outcome was this. Look at verse 29. She leaves the well, and if you recall, she even leaves her watering pot, even leaves the vessel she came to, to get water with. That All of that is now irrelevant. She has something better. She has what? Living water. And she says to the people, the Samaritans, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? So this is a really big deal when you consider how this woman has gone out of her way for years to avoid people. Okay, she's been coming to this well at midday, the hottest part of the day, when you don't draw water. No one's out and about during the hottest part of the day in the Middle East because it's brutal. But in order to avoid people, she does. And not only that, but she even goes the extra mile by traveling outside city limits just so she can go to a well where no one is at, only to find one day the Messiah himself. And she takes this news back to the people, and for the first time probably in her entire life, she's actually addressing people. She's talking to people. Before this, all this woman ever did was keep her head down. She didn't want to be seen, didn't want to be spoken to. She was an outcast. But now things have totally changed. Verse 30, then they, the Samaritans, went out of the city and came to him. So this is even more of a big deal. Not only is it shocking that she would actually start speaking to people and being bold, but in return, they actually listen to what she has to say. They actually believe this woman. Uh, if you think about it, they see for the first time a woman who has been an outcast for years with nothing to say to anyone, and now all of a sudden, it's like she's doing backflips from out of nowhere. There's got to be something to this. Mm -hmm. So this is why they would actually believe her and, and follow her back to Jesus. And in verse 31, it says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed, saying, Master, eat. So right as Jesus, if you recall, talk about perfect timing, right when he revealed himself to the woman, that he was the Messiah, that's about the same time the disciples turned the corner. Okay, so perfect timing. Now she knows he's the Messiah, and she takes that news back to her people. In the meantime, his disciples show up with food. And it's been two or three days now since Jesus has ate anything. And they say to him, uh, Master, eat. Verse 32, but Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, said his disciples one to another, has any man brought all to eat? So when they show up with food, they're probably assuming, okay, Jesus is going to be some kind of thrill to see this bread. He's gone a couple days without any food. And when they offer it to him, he says, I have, I have meat that you don't know anything about. And when he says that, they certainly they don't catch the spiritual side of this. They think someone's brought him food. They said, has anyone brought him to something to eat? <clears throat> so just as the Samaritan woman was a little confused with the whole living water thing, now the disciples are a little confused with him talking about food. And Jesus said unto them, verse 34, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So in essence, what Jesus is saying here is that doing the will of God is more satisfying than physical food. That's really what, he, what he's saying here. Furthermore, they, the disciples need to understand this is the same Jesus that fasted for how many days? 40 days and 40 nights. To go a day or two or three without food, that, that's not a big deal for Jesus. Furthermore, Jesus understood how to live off of that which was spiritual more so than that which was physical. And furthermore, elsewhere, Jesus would say that he was the manna that came down from heaven. So not only is he the, the living water, he's also the living manna as well. And then it kind of goes along with man cannot live by bread alone, but by every what? 
Word. Who's the Word? Jesus is the Word. So all that is kind of linked together in terms of food. And now Jesus, he, he turns things around uh, in terms of the harvest. Look what he says in verse 35. He says, don't you say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are already white and ready to be harvested. So scholars believe that this whole scenario here, John chapter 4, is actually taking place in the month of December. And that makes sense because Jesus says, don't you say that there are yet four months and then harvest? Well, the very first harvest in Israel is in the month of April. Okay, very first harvest. Now, obviously, that's a lot sooner than anything we harvest here in the States. But when you've got the, a very warm climate, okay, it brings uh, a sooner or a quicker harvest. So if the ver first harvest was in April, then that would put us at December. January, February, March, April. There's four months. So what Jesus, Jesus is connecting something that happens in the physical to that which is spiritual. In the physical, four months from now, there's going to be a harvest. And yet, at the same time, in the spiritual, he says, lift up your eyes because the fields are already white. They're already ready to be harvested. And this was a reference to souls, people. In, in biblical times, and even in, in nowadays, when it comes to wheat... When you grow wheat, the way you know it's ready to be harvested is it will give a white reflection from a distance. At a distance, if you look at a wheat field and you see the top of it beginning to look white like a field of cotton, that's when you know that it's ready to be harvested. Well, when Jesus says this, he knew that only minutes later, as we'll see, the Samaritans would be coming to meet him. And in that day and time, everyone wore white garments. That was just the practical color of the day. Everyone wore white. So at a distance, when you're seeing hundreds, maybe even thousands of Samaritans grouped together, what does that resemble? A wheat field ready to be harvested. So Jesus has taken that which is spiritual and applying a, a spiritual connotation to it. <clears throat> and what he's saying is the physical harvest won't be ready till April. But the spiritual harvest is ready right here, right now. And he was referring to uh, the Samaritans. And then look at verse 36. He says, And he that reaps will receive wages, and gathers fruit unto life eternal. And both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. So now Jesus highlights their responsibility as disciples. And that responsibility is to participate in winning souls to the kingdom. In other words, this is going to be their job. This is what they are to labor in. And they will receive wages for doing so. But not necessarily physical wages like we receive today, but spiritual wages. And I'll give you an example for that. As a Christian, you can't purchase good health, right? Can't buy it. But it can be given. You can receive it. Spiritually, divine healing. Uh, you can't purchase conveniences. No amount of money will keep your tire from not blowing on Interstate 81. Mm -hmm. But grace and blessings can keep that from happening. That's a spiritual yes. wage. You can't purchase satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. Can't buy it. There's a lot of things you can buy and enjoy, but when it comes to personal satisfaction, that, that's only something that comes from above. And furthermore, you can't purchase salvation. You can't buy it, or you, and you can't buy it for others. It has to be freely given, freely received. It's a spiritual wage that we receive. And just to give you a little tie-in with this, um, go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 6. I think I put it up there. Yeah, Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Talking about wages. Just as we receive wages in the physical secular environment you will also receive wages in a spiritual environment but they won't be wages that you can store up here on earth but rather in heaven. Matthew 6 19 and 20 Jesus is speaking he says lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither moth nor rust does corrupt and where thieves do not break in or steal. You've heard the old famous statement, you can't take it with you, right? You can't pull, you can pull a U-Haul behind a casket, but you can't, you can't take it where you're going, all right? And furthermore, the Bible makes it very clear that from dust you came and from dust you go back to. That's it. It's your soul and spirit that departs. So what Jesus was saying here is there's nothing wrong with having assets and having material things. Nothing wrong with that at all. But don't put your emphasis on that. Put your emphasis on storing up treasure in heaven where moth and dust and rust does not corrupt and where thieves cannot steal. You can have a lot of money and yet be robbed. Right? Mm -hmm. But in heaven, there's no such thing. All of your assets is kept safe. So Jesus is, is beginning to teach his disciples that not only will you receive physical wages and literal secular wages in life, but also spiritual. Now go back to John 4 and look at verse 37. Jesus says, And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap. That whereon you bestow no labor. Other men will labor, and you are entered into their labor. So what's Jesus saying here? First of all, he's saying, you are going to reap from something that I've already sown. Jesus already sowed the seed with the Samaritan woman. She, in turn, went to tell the others. Now they're coming back, and now it's going to be up to the disciples to reap what Jesus has sowed into. They are going to take these people and disciple them, teach them, uh, bring them up in the gospel. And throughout a Christian life, there's going to be times where you sow and others are going to reap what you sow. And then there's going to be time where someone else sows and you're going to reap from them. I'll give you an example. Let's say someone comes here to Word of Life Sunday morning and, you know, first time visitor, I preach, give an altar call for salvation, and they receive Christ. They get saved. But a month later, for whatever reason, they quit coming here and they go to another church. Well, I sowed into that person's life. But whoever has them now as a pastor is going to reap what I've sowed. But on the flip side of that, you can take a person who gets saved elsewhere and for whatever reason leave and then come here and I reap what was sowed elsewhere. Does that, you see what I'm saying here? That's what Jesus is saying. Ministry, there's no competition. Sometimes you're gonna sow and others will reap. Sometimes others will reap that which you've sowed. It goes back and forth both ways. In this particular scenario, Jesus is the one who has gone out of his way to meet this woman. He has sowed the seed of the gospel. He has revealed her, himself to her. But now it's up to the disciples to reap the harvest that's getting ready to come in. And I want to give you an example of talking about reaping and sowing and how God can use just one person, one person, to sow a whole lot of seed. How many has ever heard of D.L. Moody? Okay. If you haven't really heard of him, maybe the name, you may have heard the name. D.L. Moody was a, a very successful preacher in the late 1800s. Uh, his ministry would span across uh, the Atlantic, even over into Europe. And he would, he would become a very well-known preacher, saw scores and scores of people come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Uh, he's written a lot of books, a lot of books. And he even founded what was, what's now called Moody Bible Institute. It's a publishing company in Chicago, Illinois. And even to this day, it's still up and running. It's one of the biggest Christian publishers. Uh, if you have any Christian books or Christian-related books at home, there's a good chance it was published at Moody Bible Institute. It is such a, a well-known uh, publishing company. But how many has ever heard the name Edward Kimball? No one. No one's ever heard that name. D.L. Moody, yeah, maybe, but not Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was the Sunday school teacher of D.L. Moody. And I'll just give you a quick little uh, background on this because you'll see the tie that I'm going to create here. D.L. Moody was born into a very large family. He had multiple siblings. But his father died at a very young age. And his mother, not able to raise all the children on her own, she was forced to send some of the older ones off to live uh, with different relatives. 
one of which was a brother who lived in Chicago, Illinois. And that's where D.L. Moody went to live with his uncle. His uncle agreed to bring him in on one condition. He said, and this, he was about 13, 14 years of age. He said, you can come live with me. I'll give you a roof over your head, and I'll even hire you to work in my shoe store. Give you a wage, and that way you can, you know, try to get on with your life, make something of yourself. But there's one condition. I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday, and you have to come to church with me every Sunday. Well, he didn't have much of a choice, so that's what happened. D.L. moved in and started going to church. And his Sunday school teacher uh, was a man by the name of Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was a very quiet man, very timid, but he loved to teach Sunday school. And D.L. Moody just did not take any interest whatsoever in the Sunday school class. He was there just because he had to be there. And for like two years, he would come every Sunday because that's what the condition was, but he never engaged in the, the lessons. He never asked questions, nothing, never gave answers. And this really bothered Edward Kimball. So one day, Edward Kimball paid the uh, shoe store a visit. And he went into the back room where D.L. was. He was 17 years old at the time. And he said, listen, I know you don't have a lot of interest in Sunday school. He said, but I'm just here to tell you that if you give Jesus one chance, invite him into your heart and life, let him take control, your life will be changed forever. And you'll have a whole new outlook on life. And that was that. And even Edward Kimball would later say in his biography that after leaving, he really didn't feel like he had accomplished anything. But nonetheless, the following Sunday morning comes around and D.L. Moody shows up. And this time he was totally different, very vibrant, very talkative, outgoing, and, and really engaged in the class and asked questions, gave answers. And this went on for weeks. And and finally, Edward Kimball said, uh, D.L., I've noticed a change. He said, well, that's because I did what you, you said. I invited Christ in my heart. And you're right. I, I've never felt like this before. Well, long story short, D.L. Moody would go into the ministry, would become a very successful preacher. And one day, he was preaching a series of meetings. This was in 19, uh, 1876. By the way, he, he got saved in 1855. In 1876, he's preaching a series of meetings at a revival, and a young man by the name of uh, Wilbur Chapman came to receive Christ at his meeting. Wilbur Chapman. And Chapman, again, just like D.L., was 17 years of age. He receives Christ, and just like D.L., he becomes what? Take a guess. A preacher. He's in ministry. And he becomes very successful in the ministry, preaches all over the country. And at one of his meetings, a young man by the name of uh, Billy Sunday, he was actually a major league baseball player. He came to one of the meetings, received Christ, and ended up dropping out of the major leagues to become a preacher. Now, you know God's got to be involved for you to drop out of major league sports and become a preacher of all things. And... Uh, this was in, uh, in 1886, and during one of Billy Sunday's revivals, um, a young man by the name of Mordecai Ham, 17 years of age, see how the numbers are just staying consistent? He came and received Christ at one of Billy Sunday's revivals, and just like the rest, guess, who, guess what he became? A preacher. And became very well known. Uh, Mordecai Hans got a lot of books out there. You can look him up. And in 1934, in Charlotte, North Carolina, Mordecai Ham was carrying out a series of meetings. And once again, a young man came up to receive Christ. And guess who that young man was? Billy Graham. The late Billy Graham. Now, maybe you've never heard of D.L. Moody or all the others, but how many's not heard of Billy Graham? Nobody. We all know who Billy Graham is. But here's the, the moral of this story. There have been millions of people saved under D.L.'s ministry, uh, Wilbur Chapman's ministry, Billy Sunday, Mordecai Ham, and especially Billy Graham. Millions. Mm -hmm. But all of them who have come to the saving knowledge of Christ have one person to thank, the Sunday school teacher. Mm -hmm. Technically, the uncle that brought or made D.L. Moody come to church. 
See how God can use one person. And that's what's happening here in John chapter 4. Jesus uses the most unlikely person, the Samaritan woman who had a very immoral background, an outcast of society, but he knew that if he sowed into her, she would then go and produce, in other words, little as much when God is in it. So I wanted to give you that story just to try to tie in and show you how God can take one person and do a lot with it. Now, look at, uh, go back to John 4, look at verse 39. It says, and many. Now, in the Greek, it actually speaks of a multitude, uh, literally thousands. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. See that? Which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Now, most people would be ashamed if someone started bringing up their past. Not this woman. She's so impressed that he knew her past and could give her every little detail of it. She has no problem sharing her testimony. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he stayed there for two days. Now, again, this was just unheard of for a full-blooded Jewish person to even deal with a Samaritan, let alone stay in the city for any length of time and jesus spends the night there not one night but two literally stays there with them and evangelizes the whole city look at verse 41 and many more believed even more after he stayed came to the saving knowledge of christ but here's something that really stood out to me and many more believed because of his own word that's important up to this point, no one has really embraced Jesus because of his word. It's only because of his miracles. Remember back in John chapter 2, during the week of Passover, when Jesus begins performing miracles, and it says they believed on him for the miracle's sake, but he did not reveal himself to them? It's because they only believed him based on the miracles. They were only following him based on the signs and wonders. But here, these people have a more genuine faith, they haven't seen a single miracle. Nothing that we know of. Only his word, and that was all they needed to believe. And then they said to the woman, verse 42, Now we believe not only because of your saying, for we ourselves have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So again, this was really the, the beginning where Jesus would start incorporating non-Jewish people into his redemptive plan. And it also appears that this woman has now been accepted back into her own society. Notice how they said to the woman. They're speaking to the woman now. Whereas before, the only thing anyone ever had to say was something bad. But now they're giving her credit. So Jesus is doing a lot here. He's not only revealing himself as Messiah, but he's healing some <coughs> some wounds, some deep scars, he's, he's mending back together. And technically, out of all the Samaritans that came to him, there was one person they could thank for that. Who was it? The Samaritan woman. The one woman that was seen as an outcast all these years is now the one they can, can give thanks to. So that finally closes out event number 30. Uh, let's move into event number 31. Event number 31, public ministry in Galilee. So Jesus now leaves uh, the small town of Sakar, the place of Jacob's well, and he moves towards Galilee. Now, I've been, I've been giving you backward bearings. Last week I said Jesus had been heading south, and I don't know why I said that. He was actually headed north, okay? And let's just go back real quick and put some things together. We know that Jesus' ministry began when he was baptized by John, okay? That was in Judea, okay, where the Jordan River runs through. Judea, right outside Jerusalem. From there, Jesus goes into the wilderness of Judea where he's tempted for how many nights? 40 days, 40 nights. And then from there, he comes back to where he was baptized and begins calling disciples. The first two was Andrew, followed by John. Then Andrew goes to get Peter. That's another example how Andrew, the quiet one, finds his brother Peter, and Peter really becomes the loud one. You know, it just goes to show how God will use one person. Uh, but you have Peter, uh, John, and Andrew, and Jesus begins to take them north. 
and they start traveling through different regions all the way to where? What, what was the city or the town where Jesus performs his very first miracle? Starts with a C. Cana. Cana. And that's also where he incorporated Nathaniel and Philip. Or I should say Philip and Nathaniel. Uh, Philip found Nathaniel. Nathaniel says, what goods ever came out of Nazareth? <laughs> but they're in Cana, okay? And he performs his first miracle at the wedding feast. And then from there, he goes to Jerusalem, back south, okay? Jerusalem's right outside Judea. He's in Jerusalem where he cleanses the temple and then carries out ministry for the next week. And then from there, he leaves Jerusalem, goes back into Judea, and he and John are baptizing side by side, right? And then finally, John's arrested because he starts knocking on Herod's door, telling Herod he can't have his brother Philip's wife. He's in prison, and then finally, he's beheaded. After that, Jesus leaves Judea and goes out of his way to Samaria, okay? And then from here, he moves, continues to move north. Samaria was just a little bit north of Judea, and then um, from there, Galilee. So he's working his way back north, and now we've come to Galilee. This was really the area where Jesus spent most of his ministry at, was Galilee. So he leaves the car now, he's, he's left Jacob's well, and he comes to um, Galilee. Now look at verse 43, it says, Now after two days he departed, and he went into Galilee. So again, he was in Samaria for two whole days preaching the gospel, and not only was his disciples responsible for making disciples, but even Jesus himself, he continued to carry out ministry. And then he says in verse 44, For Jesus himself testified, that a prophet has no honor in his own country. And what Jesus was saying here was uh, the Samaritans, a half-breed, accepted him quicker than his own people did. Remember, his own people only followed him because of his miracles, whereas the Samaritans believed based on what? His word. And that's where Jesus comes in and says that a prophet has no honor in his own country. Galilee really wasn't his own country. Judea was his own country. So he leaves Judea, comes to Galilee. Um, since you're still in John, turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 10. John kind of comes right out of the gate in chapter 1 and just reveals how Jesus, as God, was rejected by his own. John chapter 1, verse 10. He's, referring to Jesus, was in the world... And the world was made by him. Christ is technically the creator of this world. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own. And look what it says here in verse 11. And his own received him not. But as many that did receive him, that's us, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And this is a reference to both Jew and Gentile. Anyone who believes on him, he will give power to become the sons of God. So even by now, Jesus is already getting the cold shoulder by his own people. Okay, and That's sad because for centuries they've been waiting for him, the Messiah. And now that he's come, they're only following him based on what they're seeing and not on what they're hearing. And faith comes by hearing, hearing not by what you see but by what you hear, and hearing by the word of God. Verse 45, go back to John 4, verse 45. And when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem, for they went to the feast. So the same people that saw him in Jerusalem perform miracles are the same people here in Galilee. And they only believe him based on his miracle-working power. Uh, if you go back to John chapter 2, go back to real quick. John chapter 2, look at verse 23. 23 through 25, it says, Now when, when he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So these are the same people now that he's ministering to in Galilee. And the only reason they, they really believe him is based on his miracles, what he's doing, not necessarily 
what he's saying, but that's about the change. And it's going to change with the last event that we'll deal with tonight, event number 32. Event number 32, and this is just going to pick up where we left off here in John, verse 46, and this is titled, Another Miracle in Cana. Remember, the first, very first miracle Jesus performed was in Cana, the wedding feast. And then he continues to, to perform an untold number of miracles in Jerusalem. But now he, he leaves Galilee and he comes back to Cana. And he performs yet the second miracle. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. All right, Cana, again, is where he performs his first miracle, and he's done a lot of traveling since then. He's come all the way down to Jerusalem, then back into Judea, Samaria, Galilee. Now he's all the way back up to Cana. And Cana is actually a neighbor to his hometown of Nazareth. Um, the nobleman that's mentioned here is Gentile. Okay, No Jewish person would be called a nobleman. Uh, furthermore, uh, he had a son that was sick at Capernaum, and Capernaum was primarily a Gentile community. But this nobleman would have been a royal official of Herod. Herod was king of Judea and the whole region of Galilee. So this nobleman is actually better translated as a royal official. Uh, most translations will translate it as that. He was a royal official. In other words, he was probably most likely a centurion or something to that effect. He was a, a Roman guard that ha had a very high rank. He's from Capernaum, and Capernaum was about 13 miles uh, west of Cana. So this man hears about Jesus as he's traveling through Galilee, and this man has a son who is very, very sick. All right, look at verse 47. <clears throat> and when he heard, now that's key right there, okay? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him how he would come down, come down to Capernaum, and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So apparently, as Jesus is ministering through Galilee, word makes it all the way up to Capernaum, west of Galilee and even Canaan. And that's where this man was stationed. He was one of Herod's uh, royal noblemen. And he had a son that wasn't just sick, but was literally dying. His, his life was really starting to leave his body. That's how sick he was. And now being willing to just put his prideful, his royal pride beside or behind him, he goes after the only source that he has any chance in, and that is Jesus. The one he's heard all about who's been raising dead people, healing blinded eyes. I mean, he's done an untold number of miracles, and this is his last resort. Look at verse 48. Then said Jesus unto him, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. See, that's the problem everyone's had all this time. They've only believed because of the signs and wonders, but without them, Jesus is a nobody. Without the, the performance, Jesus is just a man. That's at least from their perspective. But when Jesus said this, he was testing the man's faith. And the man says in verse 9, The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child dies. In other words, uh, this could be translated, Come to Capernaum before my child dies. And even here, uh, this nobleman doesn't have enough intellect to call Jesus Messiah or Savior or any of that. He just says, Sir. But nonetheless, he's calling on the right sir. And Jesus said unto him, go your way, your son lives. So much for coming all the way to Capernaum. Jesus just spoke a word, and that's it. Go your way, your son lives. Mm -hmm. And look at the result here. This is the key. And the man did what? He believed. And he believed what? The word. There it is, the word, not the miracles, not he believed the word. Jesus made it a point not to go to Capernaum to perform a miracle. He wanted this man to believe his word. Mm -hmm. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And as he was now going down, remember, this is like 13 miles away, so it would have taken probably two days to get back home. 
his servants met him and told him, saying, your son lives. He's not just healed, but he's, he's made completely whole. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. In other words, when he started receiving strength, when you saw a change, what time of day was it? Just out of curiosity. And they said unto him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, thy son lives and himself believed. And it gets even better. Who else believed? His whole house. Jesus took this one man, just like he took the woman, sent him back. And now he's a witness to his whole house that Jesus is Savior. Uh, the seventh hour, all right, Jesus came to the well on the sixth hour, which was around what time? Noon. Noon. All right, 12, 12 ish. So the seventh hour would be around one ish. So one o'clock is when this man initially came to Jesus on behalf of his son. And Jesus said, go back home, your son lives. That was at one o'clock. The very next day when he meets his servants, he asked, what time did he start recovering? Oh, it was yesterday around one o'clock. And that's the exact same time Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. Uh, I want to give you a reference. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 8. This reminds me of a different occasion, but had very similar results. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is dealing with yet another Gentile, and it just so happens to be in Capernaum. Okay? Jesus finds himself in Capernaum. This is about two years into his ministry. Uh, Matthew 8, verses 5 through 13, it says, And when Jesus had entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. And another word would just be a nobleman, okay? a royal official, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant, lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. See, there's your classic example where a prophet is not received in his own country, and yet here's a Gentile that says, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just, just say the word. That's all you have to do. Say the word, and my, my servant will be healed. And that's really what Jesus has already done back in John chapter 4. And Jesus would go on to say, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. Who, who's this? Israel. They were initially the, the children of the kingdom, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed the self same hour. So there's just a, another occasion where Jesus spoke a word only, and at that same moment, uh, the person was healed. And we'll go ahead and that is perfect timing. We'll close out with that tonight. Um, like I said, some events we'll spend a lot of time in. Other events we'll kind of breeze right through them. Uh, event number 30 took some time. Uh, the woman at the well, just because there's so much information there. But then uh, 31 and 32, we kind of uh, breeze through them fairly quickly. So next week we'll pick up uh, with event 33 and just continue to move forward. Any questions, comments, anything you want to add to? We all that last verse says that was Jesus' second miracle. The second miracle. In Cana. In Cana. Yeah. That yeah, in Cana. In Cana. Uh, and that's that's tricky because it wasn't his second, second miracle. Right. I second mean, obviously. Cana. But it was the second in Cana. And uh, that was a big deal because the first miracle was the Wedding feast, turning water into wine. 
Now, we're not told, up to this point, we're not told what other types of miracles Jesus has performed other than just signs and wonders. And we can assume, I think rightly assume, that there was the raising of the dead, healing of blinded eyes, lame to walk, deaf to hear, dumb to speak, the list goes on. Uh, signs and wonders involved really everything. Uh, but there's a special note here in Cana that this was his second miracle. And I think the reason John brings that out, remember Cana was that rivalry town that did not like Nazareth. And it was Nathaniel that said, what good could come out of Nazareth, yeah. right? Well, yeah. Jesus shows up to the rivalry town and, and purposely performs yet another miracle just to try to, I don't think he did it out of spite, but just to show that, well, what comes out of Nazareth is good uh, because the Messiah came out of Nazareth. Yeah. But yeah, good point, Ken. It was the second, second miracle recorded there. And I think, don't hold me to this, but I think that's the last time Jesus comes to Cana. Uh, I think. Don't hold me to that. But I don't believe he spent much time there. He, he primarily focused on uh, Galilee and Judea and Bethany. That was kind of his, uh, his roundabout travels was in those areas, with Jerusalem being the stopping point for each Passover. All right, anyone else? Any comments, questions? Go ahead and close out in prayer. Father, we thank you again for giving us this study, for giving us your word, your word that holds true but never fails. We just ask that you will help us to keep your word, to abide by it, uh, to live it out, and to apply it to our hearts and lives. Uh, be with us throughout the remainder of this week and bring us back at your appointed time. And we ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.